Greetings, fellow learners. Now, before we get into this wonderful world of the Informer time series architecture, I have a thought-provoking question for you. What part of artificial intelligence interests you? Is it coming up with solutions to time series problems like the one in this video? Or do you less like the nitty gritty details of model building and love the industry problems with packaged solutions? Or is it something else? I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below, so please comment. Now, this video is going to be divided into a couple of passes where we start with the informer architecture at a high level, and then we're going to dive much deeper into each component of the informer itself. So there's going to be a lot and it's going to be fun. So let's get to it. For this first pass, let's illustrate a high level working of the informer. So this is the informer architecture and to the input, we pass some time series vector. Each vector corresponds to available data points at that given time step. This information is then passed into the encoder and through this encoder, it undergoes some attention and distillation operations. And we get some output encoder vectors. These output vectors have less time steps than the input and they are some transformation of the input. These are then passed into the decoder and we also pass some subset of the input to as context to the decoder. And we generate the next chunk of time steps as the output of the decoder. And this is the high level overview of how a data flows through the architecture. Quiz time. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Why do we pass the context to the decoder? A. It isn't really required and we should just pad everything with zeros. B. It isn't really required and we should just pad everything with ones. C. To establish the cross attention for long sequences. Or D. To establish a starting point for generating coherent outputs. I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answer is D, but can you tell me why? Comment your reasoning down below and let's have a discussion. And at this point, if you think I do deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. Now that's going to do it for pass one and quiz one here, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. Now for the second pass, we are going to drill into the encoder architecture part. So the encoder has four main pieces, the embedding transformation, prop sparse self attention, post attention transformations, and the distillation operation. So let's talk about each part as we dive into the architecture. This here is the architecture diagram for the entire informer architecture. So you can see these orange boxes over here, they all correspond to individual tensors. And below each of these, when I zoom in, you can see that I've put in different shapes for every single tensor as we go throughout the flow. So let me zoom out just really quick here. And you can see that this top part, this top half over here entirely is the encoder architecture. And this will be like the distillation operation, which we'll talk about shortly. And this is again, the attention plus distillation operation for the second encoder as we stack these encoders. And then this bottom piece over here is going to be the decoder architecture. So we start over here, where we then pass information to the decoder. And you can see this line over here is going to pass some extra information of the concatenated vectors into the decoder itself, which is going to be used in cross attention and eventually used to generate some outputs over here. So what I'm going to do is scroll all the way back to the beginning, and we're going to talk about the forward flow for this entire architecture. So let's start with the encoder. So the encoder flow, like we mentioned, is divided into four parts. The first part of which is going to be the embedding transformation. And that's going to happen right in this section over here. Now, before we get into the embedding transformation, let's just look at this first tensor right over here. And you can see that this says 
raw time series data, and it's going to be a 32 cross 96 cross 7 dimensional tensor. 32 is going to be the batch size. 96 is going to be the sequence length, so that is the number of time series vectors that we're passing into the encoder. 7 is going to be for each of those time series vectors, we are going to have 7 different values in every single vector. And now if you're curious about how this data looks, one example given in the original Informer paper along with the code actually uses this kind of data set over here, where we have hourly data that's logged as records, and for each hourly data we have 7 data points. And the goal eventually is for all of these data points are going to be displayed as a time series. So we are going to project or try to predict a multivariate time series. So for all of these seven points, we are going to forecast what their future points are going to look like. And so it is these seven points that you see in our current tensor. And that current tensor is right over here. Now this raw time series data is now going to be branched into three major parts where we're going to have, first of all, we're gonna create a projection and then we're going to create some positional embeddings. We're then going to create global timestamp embeddings and we will add them all together to create this final embedding. So the goal here is to add additional information and context to our current embeddings or our current vectors over here, so that they become more aware of just more timestamp related information. So this first part is going to perform a convolution 1D, which is going to create a projection of projecting each seven dimensional time series data point into a 512 dimensional embedding vector that encapsulates some meaning. Positional encodings is going to encode position information because these vectors are just vectors, they don't have uh, a sense of ordering and they're all passed in parallel too. So in order to encapsulate that ordering sense, we have like the first position over here is going to be embedded with a position embedding of one, the position embedding of two, position embedding of three, all the way up to position embedding of 96. Same thing now with the global timestamp embedding where we're going to embed though other information that includes uh, month of year, time of day, day of week, hour of day, and also special events, holidays, and whatnot, and all of them will be encapsulated into individual tensors, which we then add to the original projection over here in order to get this final embedding that just has more information. And hence, we have this embedding of 32 cross 96 cross 512. And this completes the phase one of embedding transformations. Now I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so that we can see this next phase over here. So this truly begins now, the encoder phase of the informer architecture. And this is now phase two where we're going to do prob sparse self attention, right? And it's gonna be this pretty big and complex looking layered architecture until I guess this point over here. So let's go back to the beginning and see what we're doing. So for, first of all, this architecture is going to have eight different parallel heads here, and this is for multi-headed self-attention. And the idea here is that if we want to perform attention across eight different parts, it's going to be in parallel. And it, this way, the network is going to understand the complexities of the data and you know the mapping between the inputs and the outputs much better and hence we perform multi-headed self-attention, and we perform it with eight heads. So each of these 512 components is now going to be divided into eight components of 64 dimensions each, which we see reflected in the query, the key, and the value tensors over here. So the query key and value tensors are just going to be for every single time series 512 dimensional vector or 64 dimensional vector per head, we are going to split that into three different vectors, a query vector, a key vector, and a value vector. And so you can say that they are just different interpretations of the same input timestamp. Now, before getting just too deep into this, I just wanna emphasize that we're performing these prob sparse self attention instead of like a simple full attention because the prob sparse self attention is going to be more efficient 
in terms of like very long sequences, because typically for long sequence data, the full attention operation is going to be quadratic in sequence length. Whereas this prob sparse attention, despite it being more complex, as you see here, is going to be only order of n log n, where n is the sequence length. So it's a more efficient way to deal with long time series data. And hence, we're using it here. So we have the query key and value tensors. And for each of these cases, we are then going to create LQ bar and LK bar. So LQ bar is going to be F is just some factor, which we assume to be five. LQ, we already know, is the length of the sequence, which is 96. And this log here is a natural logarithm. So natural log 96, and the sealing operation is here. So that's going to be four point something. It'll be sealed to five. Multiplied by five from the factor, we're going to get LQ bar is 25. And the same exact operation is going to happen with LK bar. So this is going to be a constant that we will use momentarily for sampling. So now we run it through a key sampler. And in the key sampler, you can see that the, um, the shape here is going to be 32, which is the batch size. 96 is every single query vector. It's going to be mapped to, for every query vector, we're only going to sample 25 key vectors each. And these are different sampled key vectors for different query vectors. So we'll have 25 key vectors, and the dimension of each key vector is going to be 64 dimensions. Hence, we have the shape 32 cross 96 cross 25 cross 64. Now we're going to transpose the last two dimensions over here and multiply it with the original query tensor. And so we are going to multiply a 36, 32 cross 96 cross 1 cross 64, multiply by 32 cross 96 cross 64 cross 25 tensor. And we will get a 32 cross 96 cross 1 cross 25 dimensional tensor. We will then squeeze dimension. Squeeze dimension is basically used to indicate that we will remove the excess one dimension over here. So it becomes a 32 cross 96 cross 25 dimensional tensor. So it's going to be for every query, we have a subsample of keys whose interaction term, or rather affinity term, is going to be represented by a single number. Next, we are then now going to compute this M. So this is the max affinity of query for any K divided by the mean affinity. And all in all, all of this is just going to do for every single query vector. We just want to get what is the most important query vector that has the most amount of information encoded into it. And we're going to encode this information as a single number for every query vector. And that's why the output of this is going to be for every batch, 32, we have 96 numbers, and each number is going to correspond to an affinity or importance. And we only want to extract the most important queries here. That's In this case, it's going to be the LQ bar most important queries, which is we determined to be 25. So we have the 25 most important queries stored in mtop. And now we're just going to select those queries from the original query tensor. So of the 32 cross, of the 96 queries, we're only going to select 25 of them, which is why we have a 32 cross 25 cross 64 dimensional tensor. Next, we're going to apply it to the transpose of the key vector, which is 32 cross 64 cross 96 in order to get a tensor of 32 cross 25 cross 96. So what this means is that for every important query vector, we are going to determine what is their interaction with all of the keys. Next, we are going to perform some scaling. Scaling is going to be used to stabilize values during the training phase. And then we perform a soft max operation. And this is going to help us compute the attention values as the values in the tensor here are now going to be squished between zero and one. And they'll also like sum to one for every single query. We'll see that the record will sum to one. Now we have this attention matrix. We are going to apply it to a value tensor in order to get an attention value tensor. And we will also update a context vector here. The, the context vector is simply going to be some mean initialized vector where all of the components are going to be the same. And we will now update that with whatever the most important tensors are going to be here. So 25 of the 96 tensors or records are going to be updated with active query information 
whereas the remaining other 96 minus 25 cases, which is like 71 cases, are going to be just the same mean context vector. So you can see how we have active vectors that are going to be 25 in number, and then we all have the lazy vectors, which are going to be 71 in number. We then have eight of these attention heads, so we have eight of these tensors, which we concatenate along the last dimension 64, in order to get a 32 cross 96 cross 512 tensor back. And this largely completes the second phase, which is prob sparse self attention. And like I mentioned before, we are performing this entire operation instead of just a simple query times key, because if we just multiply the query times t key for full attention, it's going to be extremely expensive for very long sequences. And hence, we are performing this operation just for an FYI. Now that we have this tensor, we're gonna do a series of transformations. So by these transformations, like one of the transformations is like dropout. Dropout is a mechanism to regularize the network, turn off random neurons so that the neural network can learn along different paths. And this will be better for generalization during the inference phase. We then get this result and we will add a residual connection which comes from all the way before the previous prob sparse attention phase. So it's adding this embedding vector over here. It's gonna flow all the way over here and we will add these two tensors together to get a 32 cross 96 cross 512 dimensional tensor. Now we use residual connections in general for especially very deep networks for the sake of back propagation because during backpropagation, the, when we propagate a loss function, the gradients will be large towards the end of the network, but they get smaller and smaller as they propagate further and further. And as the network becomes too long, you can see at some point the gradients might tend to zero, which means that the networks, the, at least the neurons towards the beginning of the network are not even going to learn that much. And hence they'll just eventually become dead neurons to learn. And because of no learning, the neural network itself does not learn much. And this is the bane of very long networks in practice. And hence, to combat this, if we add a residual connection, now the gradient can, instead of just flowing completely only in this direction and kind of fizzling out, it can flow along this residual connection in the backward direction so that it reaches these initial layers so that they can learn more appropriately. So let's go back. And now we have added that residual connection to get this 32 cross 96 cross 512 dimensional tensor. Now we transpose the first and last dimension. So it's a 512 cross 96 cross 32 dimensional tensor. We then pass it through a convolution 1D network where the size of the kernel is one. And why I mentioned size of kernel is one is typically a convolution is going to learn some information locally about individual time series neighbors. But in this case, each time series vector, because the kernel size is just one, it's not really going to learn about local information and simply going to act as a linear transformation of itself. So every 512 dimensional vector is now going to be a 2048 dimensional vector, which is why we have this shape over here. So we take this tensor, now pass it through an activation function, which will help the network understand more complexity and learn more complexity in the data no change in shape. We perform dropout, again, no change in shape. And then we're going to now transpose the first and last dimensions of 32 cross 96 cross 2048, perform the similar linear transformation convolution over here in order to change it from 2048 dimensions to just a 512 dimensional vector, which we see over here. And again, we'll perform dropout plus a residual connection to ensure that the gradients flow through the network in order to get this tensor over here again. And we're then perform layer normalization in order to get the tensor of the same shape. Layer normalization is again used here to stabilize the values of the tensor so that training just becomes more stable. And this here, if I zoom out, you can see I've ended this encoder block over here. And this is going to end phase three, which was the post-attention transformations. Now, the phase four is known as the distillation operation. Zooming out a little, it looks like this, where we have this trapezium. And we're going to perform 
distillation, which involves taking the current tensor and only extracting the most important time series vector information from it. And so you'll actually see a decrease in the shape of the tensor towards the end. And this is, in this case, it's going to decrease by half. And that's why I have the shape of a trapezium instead of just a rectangular block. So let's see how that happens. So to start the distillation process, we have the 32 cross 96 cross 512 dimensional tensor. And we have a bunch of active queries or relatively active queries. And then we have a bunch of lazier timestamps over here. We can then pass them into this convolution 1D operation. Now, this is no longer going to be just a linear transformation. It's also going to learn about some local context information. And it also has some padding to it as well. And, but the shape effectively is not going to change. It's still going to be a 32 cross 96 cross 512 dimensional tensor. And this is just used to get to know like local context. Next, we have an activation function, ELU, and then followed by batch normalization to stabilize the training phase. And then we'll have a max pooling operation. Now, what's important to know about this max pooling operation is that it's going to have a stride of two which means that it's going to keep skipping over two time steps at a time. So that means that effectively the 96 time steps is going to only turn into 48 of the most active and rich information time steps here. And that's how we have the entire input reduced into half, right? Because of the distillation phase. And this here is going to complete one entire encoder plus a distillation phase. So that's like the four steps that we mentioned for one encoder run. But we can also stack encoders here too. And so we can pass this information into another encoder plus distillation phase, where if we pass it to the encoder here, in this case, it's going to be a 32 cross 48 cross 512 dimensional input. And then by the output of the encoder, it's gonna be the same shape. And then this is gonna be input to the distillation phase where we want to extract the most active uh, time series data. So from 48, it's going to be 24 now. So we have the output as 32 cross 24 cross 512. And it's this concentrated feature vectors that's then going to be passed right here through this white line all the way into the decoder over here. And this is gonna be used in uh, cross attention, which we will discuss very shortly. And so this here, entirely, as you can see, is going to be the encoder flow from the front all the way to the end over here. Quiz time. It's that time of video again. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Which of the following is the most accurate statement about the encoder? A, it makes use of full self-attention for efficient processing. B, it makes use of full self-attention for simplicity. C, it makes use of prob sparse self-attention for efficient processing. D, it makes use of prob sparse self-attention for simplicity. I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answer is C. But can you tell me why in the comments down below? And let's have a discussion. Now that's gonna do for quiz time and pass two of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. So the decoder is going to have five main pieces. It's going to be embedding transformation. It's gonna be prob sparse self attention. Then we're gonna have a full cross attention. Then we'll have some post attention transformations and then an output projection. So let's discuss each of these in the decoder. So back into the decoder over here, we start from the beginning. This is the raw time series data that we're gonna pass into the decoder. And it's going to be a batch size of 32 with 72 items in the sequence, along with each of these time series vectors is going to be a vector size of seven, because that's just how the data is for now. Now, how do we actually construct this data? Well, 48 of these 72 vectors are actually just going to come from the original input to the encoder. We just extract the last 48 time series vectors, 
and construct this vector over here. And then we will concatenate it with a padding tensor, which will pad the remaining like 24 of these time series vectors with just zeros or ones. And that is how we construct the time series data of 32 cross 72 cross 7. Next, we're going to perform the exact same operations for the first phase, which is going to be the embedding transformations. We already discussed this previously, but just a very quick recap is we take the raw time series data and we create three projections. The first is the original projection of the data where we embed the seven dimensional uh, tensors to 512 dimensional tensors over here. We then add this to position encoding data because the input here doesn't have any sense of ordering. It's all passed in one shot. And so we can encode first position in the first case, second position in the second case, all the way down to the 72nd position in the 72nd case. And then we have the global timestamp information, which can be encoded into this tensor, which could be hour of day, day of week, month of year, special events, holidays, and more. We can then add all of these tensors together in order to get the final embedding with more information. Now, this 512 dimensional tensor can now be passed into phase two, which is going to be a similar prob sparse self attention for this decoder. So what this entails is that we are going to use multi-headed self attention for learning increased complexities within the network. We'll break this down to query key and value tensors, each of 64 dimensions each, because 64 times eight is 512. And we pass through the exact same flow over here as we did for the encoder, and nothing really changes over here. And what you'll notice here is that in the end, we will end up with the same size tensor of 32 cross 72 cross 512. But the main difference is that this tensor now has inbuilt attention information. So that means that we know of these 72 tensors, there will be some subset of, in this case, it's about like 25 tensors, which would have been highlighted to have, hey, these are the most active and important tensors, and the remaining 71 of them would be slightly less, more lazy tensors. Next, before going into the third phase, which is the cross attention, we're gonna perform a couple of operations and transformations over here, which includes dropout, along with adding a residual connection, because this is another very deep part of the network, and then layer normalization to stabilize the values of the tensor, for training. And we'll end up with this tensor, which is a 32 cross 72 cross 512 dimensional tensor. Now with this, we begin phase three, where this tensor that we have here is going to be a query tensor. And then we'll have the key and value tensors is going to be generated from the features, the concentrated features we got from the encoder. And that's going to be these right over here of 32 cross 24 cross 512 each. We then pass this into the full self attention over here. So, and this is gonna be the same eight heads. And so 512 dimensions is now going to be just 64. So we have a 32 cross 72 cross 64 tensor multiplied with the key tensor of 32 cross 64 cross 24. And this is going to give us a 32 cross 72 cross 24 dimensional tensor over here. We add a padding mask so that the decoder cannot look ahead so that it is not allowed to cheat. And that's why in order to prevent that cheating and the test serve skew where we perform very well in the tra tra training set, but we don't perform well in the test set or in inference time, we're adding a padding mask here. We then end up with a 32 cross 72 cross 24 dimensional tensor and we perform a soft max to get an attention matrix. And so it's for every single 72 query that we would have had attention values for every key of how much information and attention importance is, should be given to each case. And all of those values are then imbued when we concatenate all the heads together, all of it will be imbued within this tensor of 32 cross 72 cross 512. Now this tensor over here is going to have all of the input sequence length of 72 but with some better attention values that would have been incorporated from the encoder. Next, we perform a dropout, which will again uh, turn off random neurons and help better generalization. We still get a 32 cross 72 cross 512 dimensional tensor. We add a residual connection for gradients to propagate much deeper into the network. 
We then perform layer normalization to stabilize values during training. We then end up with a 32 cross 72 cross 512 dimensional tensor. And then we perform a very similar operation like we did before, where we have a linear transformation over here with this convolution, an activation dropout, another linear transformation, along with a dropout in order to get the same exact tensor shape. And then we'll have a residual connection along with layer normalization. So a lot of these post-attention transformations that we're seeing here is the exact same as the ones that we saw in the encoder. And overall, in this case, it's just to ensure that the network has more parameters to tune and learn from, and it increases the, the complexity that can be learned by this model. And that'll complete the fourth phase. Now the fifth phase and the final phase is just going to be the output projection phase, where we take the tensor that we have generated from the decoder, which is 32 cross 72 cross 512, and we will squish the 512 dimensions down into just seven dimensions. And we do this squishification because now the seven dimensions is going to be comparable to our original data. And now we can just extract like the last 24 time series vectors, assuming we want to make predictions for the time series vectors for 24 dimensions. That's why in the beginning we padded them with zeros or ones, and now they have information within them, which is 32 cross 24 cross seven. And this can be now used as your predictions for the next 24 time steps of data. So that's the forward flow of the entire encoder and decoder architecture. Now, let's talk about how you train this. So with this tensor that you get on the outside, this is entirely a prediction. Now, during the training phase, we would have also had the true values of what these data should have been. And so what we can do is we can compare this tensor with the 32 cross 24 cross 7 true tensor of values. And because these are just regressed values, you can use like something like the mean squared error to get 32 times 24 times seven different errors. And we can take the sum of those errors or you can take the mean of those errors in order to get a single scalar loss. And when we have a loss, we can then use that to back propagate through this entire network over here. We can back propagate through all of these entire connections. And so every single one of the connections over here and parameters of the network is effectively going to learn. And when the network is introduced with so many samples like this over time, the network's parameters are going to tune better and better in order to effectively be able to predict time series information. And this here is an example prediction that we're making. So you can see the x-axis is gonna be from zero to 24 because we're making 24 timestamp predictions ahead of the current timestamp. And you could see that the ground truth is the blue line for those predictions. And the prediction is actually going to be this orange line where you can see somewhat they're actually following suite. And this is for the specific OT variable, which was like one of the seven columns in our data set. We can also do this for another column, which is the HUFL. And this is kind of here how the predictions would look here. And like that, you can do it for a third set, which is the HULL predictions, which while it doesn't get these noise bounds in the middle, it certainly picks up on the trend overall. Now, if you're curious about how the attention vectors themselves look, you can see that we have for the first layer and the first head, we will have this attention matrix, which is going to be 96 on the x-axis and 96 on the y-axis because we're performing attention here in the first spot. And you can see here that it will be, uh, you know, it's towards this like almost 90th case where we actually have some important feature vectors that are highlighted. And as you keep scrolling down, you can see it for different heads of the same layer. You can see the attention matrix too of 96 cross 96. So we should have eight of these graphs here because there is eight attention heads for every single layer. And interestingly too, if you compare these, to let's say when we perform distillation. With distillation, notice that the number of x-axis and y-axis values, instead of 96, they become 48 because with distillation with that max pooling, it kind of scrunched the number of time series vectors to be 48. 
Yet, even despite being half of the size, or rather a quarter because of the squared values over here, you can see that the attention values are still preserved, which is exactly what we want from a distillation operation. We want the preservation of information while still completely collapsing or reducing the amount of memory and space and time complexity that is taken. And so I hope you can see like the value of distillation in this informer architecture. Quiz time. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. Which of the following is the most accurate statement about the decoder? A, it uses full self-attention to help improve accuracy. B, it uses full cross-attention to help improve accuracy. C, it uses prob sparse self-attention to help improve accuracy. Or D, it uses prob sparse cross-attention to help improve accuracy. Note that multiple options here may be correct, and I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answer is B, but can you tell me why? Feel free to comment down below with your reasoning. And at this point, if you do think I do deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. Now that's gonna do it for quiz time and pass three of this video, but before we go, let's generate a summary. We talked about the informer architecture. Encoding happens in four parts. The first is embedding transformation. This allows the position and timestamp information to be captured in the vectors. Second is the prob sparse self-attention. This is an efficient way to highlight active components. Third is post-attention transformations. This enhances the stability and performance of deep networks. The fourth is the distillation operation. This extracts the active components from the time series vectors. And these active components are then passed into the decoder. And the decoder now has five parts. The first is embedding transformations, where some input from the encoder is padded and embedded, similar to the encoder itself. The prob sparse self-attention, and this is for efficient attention operation to highlight active components. The third is full cross-attention, and this is done with the active encoder components to understand historical time series data. The fourth is post-attention transformations, which enhances the stability and performance of the deep network. And the fifth is the output projection, which maps these tensors to an interpretable output prediction. And all of this is then trained through backpropagation. And that's all that we have for today. If you're curious about how the original transformer was built from scratch, check out this playlist of videos right over here. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you do like this video and I think I do deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like, and that will help me out a lot, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.